Hello and welcome to Organizational Design, The Secret to Business Growth, Resiliency and Agility. My name is Tim and I am the WebEx producer for today's webinar. It's my pleasure to introduce Josh Merzen, Global Industry Analyst and CEO of the Josh Merzen Company. Josh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tim. Welcome everybody. Uh, I, I think this is going to be one of the most important and educational webinars you go to all year and I'm not kidding. Uh, this is a really, really important topic. Kathy, can you go to the next slide? I don't think, um... here we go. Um, what we're going to do is introduce you to the topic of organization design. And it's interesting, you know, just to give you a little context, we started studying organization design over a year ago and realized that in most companies, there are a few experts and a lot of people who don't even know what it is, <laughs> or they have a conception of it uh, as being drawing org charts and making sure spans of control aren't too great. So in reality, it's much more than that. And it's extremely important right now because of what's going on in the economy. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take you through a little bit of the research first from Kathy, and then Johan and Wagner are gonna tell you about what they're doing in their companies and give you some really good examples of, uh, of what this is all about. Kathy Enderis is the SVP of research here in our company. She led the research and is really involved in all of the uh, implementation and uh, consulting we do. Jochen was gonna introduce himself, has been running the uh, org design and, and HR function for a really interesting business that um, at Bosch Power Tools and Wagner is the head of capabilities and organization design for Prudential. I'll have them each introduce themselves when we start uh, on that section. So Kathy, over to you. Thank you, Josh. And um, let's keep going on this, um, this journey of talking a little bit about the business environment and why we're even looking at org design and how we're looking at that, why it's such an important topic. So um, the war for talent, of course, everybody knows about it. Every company that we talk with is trying to hire people as fast as you can. We have about one in nine uh, jobs in the U.S. open, but it's happening around the world as well. So everywhere um, you're trying to hold on to people, you're trying to pay them more, you're trying to recruit them as fast as you can. But at the bottom of all of that is it's actually not just a recruiting problem, a learning problem, a reskilling problem, or a... Um, a um, a pay problem, but it's really an organization and work design problem because unless you have people in the right roles, you're going to not be able to hold on to them and get the best work out of them. So, so um, in that context, we really see um, a lot of change in, in terms of automation and displacement and using new technologies that impacts organization design as well. So how you design jobs is really impacted by what technologies you use for um, helping people um, move, uh, make the best of their capabilities and their um, qualifications. We're talking with a lot of healthcare companies right now to understand what's happening in healthcare. The nursing problem is, I think, a, a huge problem for healthcare organizations in the U.S. and around the world. And at the bottom of all of that is also a, an organization and work design problem because unless you can have nurses, for example, operate what they call at the top of their license, and that concept really applies to all jobs as well, you're not going to be able to fill all of these jobs. So uh, one, of the, one of the leaders we talked with in a financial services company, he told us that managers in their company are trying to overhire. So for example, they're overhiring for data scientists when they really need a person that does data cleanup. And what happens then, you get this really high powered person come into this job, um, people come to this job, they say, well, this is not what I thought I'd be doing. I'm doing data cleanup here. I, I thought I'd use all of my capabilities to do um, data science work and they are going to leave your organization. And, and that's part of this whole um, great resignation too. Industry conversions is a big theme too. So industry conversions, we're exploring that every industry, every, um, every sector is actually merging with another sector. So healthcare companies, for example, get squeezed by Walmart's retail pharmacists, uh, um, all financial services companies are now competing with Amazon. And what that means from a talent and a workforce and a work design perspective as well is um, 
that you're trying to hire from these other industries, other companies, and design the jobs in a way that they are not just industry jobs, but really broader jobs as well. So, um, so we did this really year-long study on organization and work design, and we had a, a very large scale survey where we asked like hundreds of companies, I think 300, 400 companies, on what they're doing on org design. And it was actually a pretty interesting to see what organizations are doing well and what organizations are not doing well. So organizations are generally really good at defining what business they're in, communicating, communicating their strategy. But what's really missing is agile organizational models. That was actually the lowest um, adopted process using agile organization models. And we'll ha hear from Wagner and Jochen and how they are actually using agile organizational models. But the other thing that I wanted to call out here is involving employees directly in organization design. Only 12% of organizations are doing that. Um, and if you don't involve the people that are in the, your jobs into how you design the jobs, how do you design the work, how you design the organization models, you're not going to be able to understand the jobs really well and uh, design uh, your organization for success. Um, when we look at organization design, we don't think about the org structure only. And actually, we're thinking about the org structure last, not first. When we think about organization design, we think about the business model first. What business are you in? Are you a re reseller business? Are you a... Um, um, a, um, a technology business, a services business, how you operate, how, what's your operating model to support your business model, how do you design work um, and jobs and accountabilities and how do you bring skills and experience focus in, then how you design the jobs and then how do you design the org structure. If you start with the structure, which is typically what people understand on the org design, um, it's kind of the tail wagging the dog. And um, if you start with the business model, always think about the business model first and then work your way down to how you, um, how you operate, how you design the work for success, how you design jobs, and then organization structure design. That's how you need to approach this. It's really a kind of a, we, we just talked about how this might be a little bit of an intimidating topic or a geeky topic uh, because um, in many companies, how they do organization design, it's kind of a behind the curtains kind of black box exercise that you bring some consultants in maybe once a year, twice a year, or every couple of years when something is broken, they come, they work with the leadership team, and then they reveal the big org design, new org design, and, and um, after a couple of years, maybe um, something else is broken. Maybe a new entrant comes into the business. Maybe you have a talent problem. Maybe have a, a, a business underperforming, and then you have to do it all over again. And the way to, to do it right is really not like this behind the black curtain uh, geeky topic. But every every HR leader, every compensation leader, every business leader needs to know what business you're in and how to design for success. So uh, we came up with this maturity model and what the maturity model really shows us is that only about 11% of companies are really in this highest level of maturity where they have an agile, we call it agile and accountable model where they are driving um, the, the work design from, from data, um, they reward for results, they hold people accountable, they involve employees in the organization and design themselves, and they um, balance this focus of today and tomorrow. And, um, and going to that level is actually a really, really hard journey. So, um, and you can't st uh, jump any steps. So, um, about one in four organizations, you see that we call that haphazard structure where they are in this kind of every manager is just deciding on their own what jobs they need, um, how they how they design the jobs. And um, if you over hire to that story that I just shared before, if you over hire, you're going to have at some point a problem with finance, you have too the, the, your organization is going to cost too much. And um, you have this kind of hodgepodge of different models in there that really don't serve your business really well. Um, to go to the next level, and that's the level two, we call that traditional design, where um, companies think they're already there, they're doing org design really well. And that's the behind the curtain kind of spans and layers approach where you think about 
just about the, the what I showed on this model, the right-hand side of this organization structure design, where you think about sticks and boxes, and you probably design around leaders, you design around um, what leaders you have and, and what they can do, um, and just focus on what your current customers need. But it really does prepare you well for the future. And then what happens is kind of this big jump where um, companies start um, meeting around um, doing these cross-functional meetings there where they say, well, there's still something, some, something, something more to be done where we have to collaborate across the company. We have to maybe marketing has to work with, with engineering and um, with sales around the world to really solve customer problems. But in the end of the day, then after you have all these cross-functional meetings, you go back and you go back to your functional silos and you work in that model again. And then um, as you go along, and, and we'll hear from Jochen and, and Wagner afterwards how they did that, um, you come, can come to this level four where you really uh, design not around the people but around the work, around the customer problems, and you work across, across the board to solve customer problems, not just sell your product. Um, here's some findings that we had from the, this org design study. You can read all about them. Um, just a few things that I wanted to call out. Um, I, I talked about that before. Organization design is really a, a big mystery to many, many organizations. And demystifying them is, is, might be hard, but it really, really pays off. And what's behind that demystifying organization design is not so much understanding org design methodologies, but really understanding what business you're in and what work people do and how who your customers are and what customers need to be successful. Um, what relates to that is this finding number two, where we say how you operate matters more than how you organize. And that applies to your whole organization, but it also applies to um, business function. When you think about, for example, how you design HR organizations, we get a lot of questions, learning organizations. It's not so much about who reports to who, but who works with whom and how you, how you um, inspire and enable cross-functional co collaboration to get your customers what they really need. Um, separating work management from people management, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, employee experience and capability considerations being part of the work itself, not as an afterthought. What that means is how you design jobs really needs to be involving the employees that are in these jobs and the work that, that they do. And then focusing on, on accountability and rewards is really, really important too. And what that means is um, identifying exactly one party that's accountable for customer outcomes and um, not one, uh, not two, or not nobody. So it really needs to be very clear who is accountable for what results and, um, and then rewarding people to make it successful. All right, so I wanted to talk a little bit about this um, work management and people management, breaking them out because we get a lot of questions on that as well. Because the, the model that most organizations have is that they combined work management, people management into this management role. But really that comes from the, um, maybe uh, more the, uh, like the, before we had um, kind of a knowledge economy, a service economy, where managers' roles were, were defined to pass down information to labor and, uh, and basically tell people what to do and how to do their work. But in today's uh, knowledge economy, it's really, Every, every employee, every worker knows more in a way about their job than their manager does. And so um, splitting out the work manager role, this could be project management, product management, from the people manager role, that's the role of, of people to, to uh, guide people like their employees' talent, their, their careers, their inspiring them, coaching them, enabling them, leading with functional expertise, like splitting these two roles out is actually a, a very important, um, a very important thing that you can do in your organization because usually the skill sets and and the motivations are very different from work managers and people managers. And uh, I always come back to the, uh, for example, promoting people into people management roles when they are really good at that job. So like you have a salesperson, for example, that's a great salesperson, and then you pro promote them into people management role, but they really didn't want to coach people. They really wanted to sell more. 
And that is not a good situation, of course, and we've all seen that with many different jobs. Tech jobs are another one where you might have somebody who is a great coder, a great software developer, and you promote them into a people management role, but then really they say, wow, now all day long I have to talk with people and, and, um, and maybe coach them along, but I really wanted to just develop this, this great code and, and now I can't do this anymore. Another great example is nurse managers. When we talk with the healthcare organizations, they say nurse managers uh, actually, nursing managers are the hardest job for us to, to fill and then also retain because when somebody goes into nursing, they usually don't want to do scheduling and coaching nurses. They want to see a lot of patients. So um, think about how you can split out the work manager and the people manager role. Um, why does it matter? Um, here's some statistics on why agile and accountable organization design really, really matters. Uh, huge multipliers that we have here. Um, it does, of course, it matters to um, engaging and retaining people 27 times more likely to engage and retain people. That might be a no-brainer, but also look at these innovation outcomes. Companies that do this really well, they're 30 times more likely to adapt well to change. And why is that? That's because when you um, tap into every single person's capabilities, their knowledge, their expertise, um, you design well for the future as well, and so people can really be much more sensing what's happening in the market, what's, sense, what's happening with their customers, and provide that great customer experience and customer success. Okay, cool. Um, here's, a, here's a way to think about this, um, this process of organization design, and it's really, uh, we, uh, we've laid out this, um, this framework that we sh I showed you before, in a in a kind of a way to go through that uh, your business model usually uh, you need to think about that first what business you're in you need to think about that first even if you don't redesign your whole business model overall you need need to always think about what business are we really in what kind of company are we and you might not change that and it changes usually very rarely sometimes when you, there's a new entrant in the market you might think about that differently but always when you think about even a functional uh, business unit operating model design or org design, you need to think about it in the context of what business are we really in, who are your our customers, and how, do, how are we successful. And then you think about the operating model design. Who do we sell to? How, how do you sell? What do we sell? Um, who are our customers? Um, what do they need from us? And that changes a little bit more frequently, but also still not a lot. But then you see in this, this lower box, these highly changeable areas of work design, job design, organization structure design. And um, the really key on work design, job design, organization structure design is just to make it flexible, to make it agile, to make it adaptable to any kind of changes in the business environment, in your customer requirements and new technologies. So how you go to market, what, how you design jobs for success and what structure you need um, is really should be very very flexible and agile, and we'll hear more from from Wagner and and Jochen in a minute on how they did that. Cool. So and I think yeah, we're going back to now our panel. So Josh, back over to you. Thank you, Kathy. So let me just make a couple comments about everything that Kathy just said. There's a lot there, and I know a lot of you um, probably are scrambling to write down, take notes, look at the slides, and so forth. We'll get you the slides. There is a whole research report on this um, and we are going to be launching in the early summer what we call a super class on organization design um, which is a three or four hour course you can go through to really go through this in an example a case study of a simulated company so for those of you um, that are hr people and i know a lot of you are uh, in fact really anybody you, you'll find it interesting and one more thing i wanted to just highlight and then we'll talk as a group, um, one of the things that came out of this research is that structure matters the least in the actual solution. So this isn't a structure issue. This is a rewards, focus, skills, uh, and, and many of these other factors, which you know a lot about, most of you know a lot about this, um, are more important than, you know, kind of creating the, the stick charts. So um, let me, let me um, introduce Jochen. Um, why don't you go first and uh, tell us about your role and what the company does a little bit, and then uh, what brought you to this topic? 
Uh, thanks a lot, Katie. Thanks a lot, Josh, for, for having me. Um, um, yeah, it's a very, very interesting topic. Um, I'm coming from a company called Robert Bosch Power Tools. So Robert Bosch is a 400,000 people company in Germany. And their division, which produces the coolest power tools in the world, is called Power Tools Division. They are 20,000 people, half of them direct workers in plants and half of them indirect workers trying to come up with the most product innovative products in the area of, of power tools and accessories. And what we have done actually six years ago in, in 2016, we figured out that um, we need to address uh, the market very differently because we need to be much closer to our users. And uh, we specifically use the term users because we used to sell right away through the retail stores and we didn't really uh, had so much influence over what the user really wants. So we said we really want to go on a transformational journey to put the user centricity first and make that the, the, the demand function on how we organize, how we process, how we work together. And that led up to uh, what we called an agile transformation over the last six years on a very interesting journey with a lot of ups, some downs, and I'm happy to uh, share some of the things we experienced with you guys. Was there, before, I, I want to have Wagner introduce himself for a sec, but one question on the top, on the, on the high level. Was there a specific problem that led you to go into user-centric design or what, what was it just a good idea what, what or was the competition no. changing what what because i think a lot of people are going to say why do i how do i get this whole thing off the ground yeah so i think that the, the, there are two answers to the question the first one is we didn't have a crisis situation um, and I, I say that up front not because we are smarter than anybody but it helped me in the transformational journey because it was not a not a transformation packed in 20 percent cutting it was more kind Let's reinvent how we work. And secondly, of course, there were external in internal factors. And just to highlight the top two, I would say is um, the word digitalization is, of course, not new, but it changed the whole dynamic in our industry, in a consumer goods industry, because it's not about um, it's really the user gets direct feedback on Amazon on all different channels about how Bosch is great or how Bosch is not doing great. And it basically falls into a black hole because we were not ready for being user centric. Uh, so digitalization is one thing. And the second thing is, I would call it, how, how attractive are we as an employer um, in terms of new talent? Uh, so not, engine, not only engineering power tools talent, but really like social media, digital topics, software guys. And there we really wanted to create a different work environment to uh, competing with people in the industry who hire for software developers and stuff like that. So I think these were the two Great. main drivers. Okay. So, so that's really helpful. So, so the idea is, and, and I think a lot of people on the line, I'm sure are in this situation where the thing you sell or deliver is intermediated by something in the middle, a retail chain, a supply chain, and you don't really know how people use it that much. So you mm -hmm. can't necessarily, you know, kind of change fast enough. Okay, and we'll get more. I think you're going to be fascinated what these guys did. So let me, we'll come back to you in a sec. Okay, Wagner, tell us a little bit about your role and uh, and the and sort of the problem area you guys were working on at Prudential. Sure. Thanks so much, Josh and everyone. What's really interesting, listening to this over and over, and that's the, the good news. Um, I know it's complex, but when you hear more often, you start acquiring the idea that complexity is part of our lives. So with that complexity, we went into understand that our transformation had to be physical. So the first phase of the transformation, of course, the first thing we think is let's not change the structures. Let's just optimize the structure. So we did the same as everybody one does. But then when Can I stop you for one sec, will you just tell people about the company at first and the business? <laughs> I forgot that we There's 275 we people that don't really know what you do. So let's just talk about that first. <laughs> so I'm Wagner Denuso. I lead the I'm the head of capabilities for Future of Work at Prudential. And I was hired three years ago, specifically three years ago next month. In pre-pandemic, we already had the structure of transformation. We want to transform off our company. We are an insurance company. We are global, 40,000 40, employees worldwide. And we have several lines of businesses. But 
when you think about transforming an organization that's so large and has so many lines of businesses, of course, we start with the components of the transformation by optimizing, by looking at skills. The skills economy was incredibly important to us. But Josh, when you talk about the human-centered designs, when you think about incorporating the employee and working at the top of your license, HR needs to be at the top of the license. If you want to connect the dots in organizational design, business models, and operations, HR has to connect the dots at that level of the business. So that's what we did. We create what we call talent capitalists. It's a fungible talent pool of HR, very well-enabled HR leaders, and we enable them on six points of engagement, which means workforce strategy, the skills assessments, learning journeys, transformative change, org design at this level, and we start talking to our business how we could elevate the optimization to capability identification, which leads to the work design, which leads to cross-functional collaboration. So at Prudential, we press the business to go further. But I tell you this, uh, I think we all agree on this. We start where the client is. Um, HR sometimes knows that we could go further, but we start where the client is. So, That's why I love the maturity model because it's no fault of anyone to be in the one, two, three, or four level, but it depends on the client readiness. So you, so you, you, you guys. I mean, you're a very forward thinking group. I mean, you, you understand the relationship between org design and all the other pieces of rewards and culture and skills and everything. Right. Okay. We'll talk about your situation for a minute. Okay, let me, let me go back. Kathy, I'll come back to you in a second. Mm -hmm. Jochen, so tell us about the problem you were solving, because I think it's a fascinating thing that you guys did, because it goes back to rethinking the operating model of the company. And I think this is something you guys yeah. on the line are going to not forget. <laughs> oh, man. No, no, I, need I, to thought, I, think <laughs> it's, I will never stop. No. I will never stop telling the story of what you guys did, and I think people need to hear it. No, thanks a lot, Josh, for for the for the nice words. I mean, the the, the challenge that I think I, I I mentioned already. Now, the the problem is how do you solve that, right? So we basically said we had a very clear mission to say we want to become a user centric organization based on agile values and principles, because the agile values help us a lot in terms of bringing involvement, transparency, and really co creating with the associates. Because the tricky part is, and that's very hard, at least for a German engineering company, probably the US companies are similar, you have to admit that you don't know everything, right? So you need to be aware. And the beauty, however, of a big company is you have a lot of folks in your company who can think with you. So uh, referencing to the point that Kathy just mentioned in the, in the intro is this project was, yes, directly reporting to, uh, to our CEO. Um, and we got uh, all the support that is needed from the senior management, which is fantastic. But he said, you know what, this project, I keep them very small because you need to engage with the organization. The people need to come up with the ideas, how we organize, how we work together. And we said, we want to base it on agile principles. And we came out with five pillars that we want to address. Um, so the first one is leadership. We want to lead differently. We want to have less hierarchy and we want to lead people in a different way, not in command and control, but we need the brains and the hearts of other people. The second thing is it's about collaboration. When you think about agile, it means usually smaller teams, more segregation, which is sometimes a fear of losing control. However, if you focus then on better collaboration amongst those smaller teams, you actually have a very big chance of moving faster. Then the four, third point was process and methods. Of course, yeah, when you want to be agile, you have to learn new methods. You have to adapt your existing processes. That was a different story as well. And that's the, 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 the third point. And then fourth and fifth are strategy, but rather the execution of the strategy, not defining a strategy. And then third and last, I mentioned it, the organizational uh, topic on how we uh, organize ourselves. And they are... Um, just to, to, to give two or three sentences about that one, actually, we were very fun. We had six business units and we still have six business units and they are, 
you know, we sort our products around different user needs. The home and garden business is, for example, very for DIYers at home, making their garden nice and, and, and whatever. But we have also professional uh, side of the business for the really tough work that is done on the construction side. And we have, for that, we have six business units. And these six business units have always been organized functional-wise. So there is an engineering department, that business unit, marketing department, whatever. Then we have these cross-functional projects to come up with products at the end. And what happened, Josh, is basically they had these project status meetings. They went back into their home base. So the engineering get back into the engineering department and said, good Lord, these marketing guys coming up with these fancy slides and uh, they don't know what, what the problem is, right? And the other way around as well, the marketing goes back to the to the marketing department and says the engineer now another round of his motors, but nobody cares on the market. So we said, we don't know how the solution will look like, but we have four or five principles only. And then we invite all associates to to work with us together and the two most fundamental i would say from those principles are we want to create cross permanent functional teams that means the engineer the marketeer the quality the purchase guy leave their home base and create a new home base around a user application so there's no boss potentially that has the experience that you have in engineering because your boss might be actually a marketing geek from 20 years ago so it's it's really creating this cross-functional because to make really the user in focus and have the end-to-end -end responsibility. We don't want an excuse, eh, I'm engineering, I cannot do it. It's like you're responsible for solving user needs and you're end-to-end -end responsible from innovation to carving out products, but also revenue and EBIT uh, responsibility, margin responsibility. So that's, I think, the Did, cornerstone of quick question audit. on that. So, yeah. so if you have engineers moving out of engineering into these product groups, did yeah. all of the engineers move into product groups or are there still core engineers left working on core infrastructure stuff? How did, how did that happen? Um, the, the journey was the following. We set as a default, everybody's out. Everybody's in product teams. So that was kind of- okay, So all the situation. functional groups are gone and everybody's in- Yes, a that was in the design phase. But yeah. then we said, who of you is still working on the overall brand? Who is working on creating our batteries that are in each product? Right. And then we came up with a mix of around 60, 70% working in the product and 30 to 40% work in the functional expertise teams. Why I say it, the journey is important is when you start the other way around and you ask all these functional departments, you know what, we have this crazy idea with cross-functional teams, how much people can you let go to create these cross-functional teams? In reality, you get way too less and you probably don't get the people you really want in these high-performing uh, cross-functional teams. Right. It's just. Yeah. Let me, let me just reinforce that. That's a really important point for the people in the webinar, because I've been through this with other companies, is if you do this in a tiny incremental way, you'll end up with people just doing sideline projects, but not really putting their heart into this new model. So I, I, I think that's a really interesting problem to deal with. And I, I want to hear about yeah. your idea on this, too. Go ahead. But keep going. I want to I want you to spend, spend, you know, get to kind of the next. I, I'll let you talk for a few more minutes. <laughs> Yeah, of course, the, the, the question is then how, how did we really organize and there is something that was a very fascinating situation. I mean, I joined Bosch uh, exactly six years ago, also when we started the project and we basically let the space wide open. You can sort out how you organize, but you need to be cross-functional teams and you need to be less hierarchy. And you need, uh, th these are the, from the organization perspective, the two main drivers we really put in. And then the people, it was a fascinating thing. The first two or three weeks, the people were like, I mean, you don't know a clear work package. You don't know a clear go live date. You don't know uh, what are we doing here? All these volunteers that we really uh, recruited and who wanted to take part. And then at the end of the day, we said, you know what? You come up with the solutions. And then we had different areas on how to group our, our business teams, as we call them, around the material you 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 try to work on, what kind of tools you use, the user applications, you know, um, uh, we talked it in the pre-talk, it's like one of our groups is actually called fixing. So all the tools that you need to get something fixed somewhere. One team is called removing, one is called grinding. So all the different tools that you use to have fun at home is actually building those teams around it. And that's actually a solution of our associates, how to group the teams and not of some external guys or the senior management only, but we're all okay, let, me, let me stop there because it will come back to you. So, so to reinforce this big idea for everybody on the phone, um, what Bosch 
power tools is that eventually came up with this idea is that we're not selling lines of tool lines. We're selling solutions that remove material, does, you know, create things, cut things, plant things, which allowed the organization to operate differently. So we'll go into this in a minute. Um, Bob, well, let, let me go over to Kathy for a minute. Kathy, in the healthcare industry, which you're now becoming a guru in, there's this whole idea of clinical transformation. How are healthcare companies rethinking the way they're organized to deal with healthcare? And yeah, it's, it's such a fascinating question and it's such a fascinating journey that the healthcare organizations are on. And actually, one thing that we found out, we thought healthcare is kind of a risk averse, kind of backwards industry in a way. But what we found is there's incredible innovation out there because they have to do it, because they have to, they can't operate um, their hospitals, their, their medical centers with software engineers, right? They need more nurses. They need all the nurses to be there. So the way that they are thinking about, for example, that clinical shortage of nursing um, that I think everybody knows about is, is um, redesigning the work itself. And what that means is they are thinking about how can we help the nurse um, all these nurses operate what they call top of license, top of qualification, so they're just doing nurse jobs because what they found out, healthcare found out, that nurses actually do only 30%, 40% of their time they spend on things that they are uniquely qualified to do, and 60 70% of the time they do something else. So they clean up after a patient, they check them in, they do paperwork, they do like all these other things that you really don't need to be a nurse for. You could have, they give medication, so you could... Um, design these patient-centered teams around what what the nurse has to do and then all the other things somebody else could do. So somebody else could also be a machine, by the way. Does somebody else could be a medication robot that comes around and gives the medication to the to the patient. It could be a, an aide or a, 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 what they call a patient care technician that could do the checkout procedures, that it could do the paperwork. So to free up the nurse to just do nursing stuff all the time, um, so a janitor could clean up after the patient if they get sick because right now, usually the way that it works is that you're thinking, well, the nurse is already there. They can do all these other things too, right? But what that does is it exacerbates the, the nursing shortage that you just don't have enough nurses to, to do the nursing work. And so putting these patient-oriented, patient-centered teams around um, patient problems, it goes like similar story that Jochen had uh, around um, user journeys or user problems. Um, that's really how, how the healthcare organizations are trying to solve the, right. the nursing problem, not just to hire more nurses. So, okay, so, so Jochen's talking about, uh, you know, rethinking the business model and, and really the problem we're trying to solve. In, in healthcare, we have this issue of a very, very constrained labor market and these right. highly trained people spending lots of time on things that really aren't, you know, useful to, in, in their skills. Uh, Bogner, let's go back to you. You've got this company with all these lines of insurance and all these call centers and service centers. Tell us a little bit about the problem you were solving because I think it's a really very common one that a lot of companies have. Yes, it is. Thank you. This is fascinating to listen to all the industries because at the end of the day, we are solving for similar problems. For us, it was important the first step to bring it all together. Um, customer service reps. That was the customer service reps was a key initiative for us. And we brought them all together under one roof. Why? Because our customers don't care. It's like HR. They don't care if it's talent management, if it is performance reviews. They want to know from HR what are the key messages. And customers want from us the responses to their needs. So the transactions became a really focal point. But then we start thinking, what are the organizational design that will enhance the workflow and will enhance the customer experience? We had to go one step above. What are the organizational capabilities, the work design? And to be honest, now listening to Kathy about the healthcare, is almost like the workforce planning that we are used to now has to be expanded to work resource planning, accounting for the automation, account for robotics, accounting for things that don't need to be there anymore, because that's a cost saving. And at the end of the day is retention, 
and it is a value proposition for companies that hire people qualified to do qualified jobs. Well, let me, so in your case, as I remember the story, you had lines of insurance, each of which had their own customer yeah. service groups. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, so and tell us what you them. did about that. <laughs> yeah, so we brought them together and then we decided that they have to start elevating their roles to become not customer service reps, but customer, customer service professionals. And at the end of the day, what we really want them to become is the customer advocates, because the capability we're building is the omnichannel, frictionless customer experience. So when you have this very crystal clear strategy, business model, operating model becomes the second part, which is how do we create operating model that facilitates this to happen? So we have to change a lot of layers. We had to change how people were accustomed to working the front line. And we start enabling them, enabling the back office to understand what the issues were and the digital dexterity that we enable our customer frontline workers with was critical because now they have access to respond to customers and not only do transactions. Well, if, you have, if you have a more universal, so is this, this is the idea of a, of a universal customer service person as opposed to the life yes. insurance person, the yes. property and casual, how do yes. they learn what they need to know? <laughs> well, that's the thing, uh, of course, for those of you who have frontline workers, it's very critical to understand how do we enable people without taking them out of their shifts. Um, so we had very creative ways of doing campaigns, creative ways of doing micro learning and the digital dexterity and all this. But at the end of the day, you know what it did? It gave the opportunity for employees to be involved in the creation of this whole structure. So the human centered design. Okay, so getting employees involved yes. in the design, which Kathy exactly. mentioned in the beginning, which I don't think most companies do. By the way, for those exactly. of you on the webcast, go ahead and start asking questions because I'm going to look at some of your questions if you have any, but I'll go back around a little bit. Yeah. Um, Yakin, are you still there? I, <laughs> yes, I'm there. Okay. I'm there. Um, so getting into this new idea of designing these groups around problems versus tools. Um, mm -hmm. What happened? You know, what have you learned in that process? Did you have to reskill people? Did everybody have to go to design thinking classes? Was it obvious? Did you come up with a whole bunch of new product ideas? I think you mentioned you're getting into services. What, what, what's, what's happened as a result of this new organization? I mean, uh, when you do such a big transformation uh, some of ups there are some downs as well right so um we, i mentioned we have six business units so we transformed the whole power tools division all so six business units but we did it iteratively over a course of two or three years that means um we learned from what we did at this business unit, applied it or re-engineered it and learned from it so this iterative approach i think is also from agile very very good you don't need to know everything from the beginning to get better and um, the second thing is I think we got much more, the, the question I always get asked, did we get better? How did you measure, right? Which KPIs did get better? And there I need to say a big thank you to, to our senior management who actually started the journey without that clear set of KPIs that we want to measure. And it sounds a bit strange, but uh, they, if for everybody knows in big corporations, if you set out KPIs, people try to make the KPIs work with not really understanding the underlying thing behind. And secondly, sometimes, which KPI do you put up front if you don't really know what problem you want to solve but where you want to go so at the end of the day um i think looking back now i think when we look at creating great products and services for our users we got much better user reviews quantitative reviews that the perceived quality from our products has been increasingly very did you, high. Did, you did, did you come up with some, I think you told me you came up with some new ideas for things that had not really been in the product strategy before. Is that correct? Yeah, because I think in, in certain areas, you know, just think out loud. Um, if you are in part of the team of, um, of, of fixing, right? Fixing something in the wall. The traditional thing is you buy a tool that makes a hole in the wall so you can fix something in the wall. But at the end of the day, uh, just if you want to hang something on the wall, you just 
yeah, tool is nice, but you could also hang it on the wall without hang, using a tool, right? So this team comes up with innovative solutions. Of Did you course, come up with something that allows you to hang pictures position. and line them up so they don't get out of kilter without doing five hours of measurement? <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Whereas one one of our business teams is is uh, or a business unit is looking into measuring tools. So we have this appliance that actually puts all the lines on the on your wall, and then you can use the other tool from us to to. Really That's make a billion it dollar easy. business right there that that was badly yeah. needed for a long time. I've tried to hang pictures and I've never done it right. I yeah, need to. <laughs> usually, not, I'm usually not, not a big friend in my house when I do that. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. So Wagner, on your case, uh, so as I understand it, you you brought together these, you know, kind of insurance line, service groups, and you created some kind of a centralized group. What did what came at, what is what has the has the company learned from that, and what what did you find to be, you know, challenges in that? Because I think that's a pretty common issue in a lot of companies that kind of problem. Well, the challenges are many because you're talking about frontline workers who are used to serving one silo. Mm -hmm. So the number one is employee flexibility, adaptability, and the capability to learn. So we had to work with them. But the good news is that they are moving towards uh, internal mobility as well. So we promote the idea, more skills you have, more chances you are to cross lines in the business and go work in different functions. So that's working really well. 11 points year on year increase in internal mobility because we are promoting that kind of cross-functional mobility. But the other issues that we, we perceived is that, of course, lines of businesses are interested in controlling and managing what happens to their customers. And I think that's natural. When people are in this seminar, probably they're talking about structures. The first thing our leaders talk about is structures is because there is a sense of control. And to Josh, what you were saying at Bosch, you have to let go of control to allow your people to deliver the best work. So yeah. we had to do that. So there has you to be a common to, agreement at the senior levels that, yeah. that this new, yeah, because if I run the property and casualty business and, I, and this call center is not doing exactly what I want, you know, right, I want exactly. it to do what I want, not what everybody, yeah. <laughs> so, as uh, somebody mentioned on the chat, leadership. Yes, leadership is critical. But when you show the value of org design in a different way, they understand we are not talking about moving chairs and eliminating chairs of the equation. And that's the exciting part. So, for you HR leaders who want to do the work, you start collecting the value creation uh, element of this. You, you, you eliminate a lot of waste. And you create value through human-centered design. How do you, so, so there is a question here from Thomas about middle management, and I've heard this before in other org design problems. So middle managers are, to some degree, the uh, casualties in this sometimes. Um, what experience do you guys have in, in you know, their roles, their input, their fears? <laughs> what are they just I mean, jobs? No, no. I mean, I, let, let's uh, let's try to reinvent, and perhaps it connects a bit with what Kathy said with the workforce and people management. Yeah. I think from a traditional perspective, we didn't have any better solution for really good people to develop further than to offer them leadership positions. So if you really want to grow sooner or later, the company basically either told you directly or through lived experience, you actually need to get a big team. And I think that thing needs to be, it, it's broken and it actually is not helpful for also be ready for, for the future and the present. So if we admit that you can also get a good career, whatever that means for you, you know, having more autonomy, more money, more status, I don't know what it is for every, it's very individual what career means, right? Um, but that could also mean that really companies need to, and I think I've seen it still in a lot of companies where this is not really seen that perhaps the leader is not the highest paid pays job, but the expert is. So I think if we remove that thinking that only middle managers are the guys with all the perks and all the nice autonomy and money, then I think that turns a different perspective. And I've seen actually a, a really a high number of people in my organization who basically 
say it's great what we can do here it's great that i can be myself now and and uh, yes of course you lose also people along the way so i don't make a yes. i mean it's also <laughs> okay but that's uh, also part of the uh, so, of the so in your case it's been a positive contribution to employee engagement yes, and definitely <laughs> that's my, certainly my belief is that Organizing around problems and getting rid of hierarchy usually gives most people a better job. Well, yes. except for this one guy who just won't let go of the reins and he, <laughs> for some reason, just thinks that's what he needs to do. And it's usually yeah. he, and I don't mean to be sexist about it, but. <laughs> however, however, Josh, I need to, I want to add to that actually. Don't start such a transformation and put human-centered and agile on slides if you have the goal to cut 30% in, 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 in money, right? Because these, when you want to say, and I think a reference to you, Wagner, that there's a customer advocate and not a rep anymore, that engages more responsibility, which usually doesn't come cheaper in a way, right? And we have the same topics here. So I think we need to be so on, also honest to the associates. It shouldn't, it doesn't necessarily need to be a get more expensive, but the goal is not to get cheaper, cheaper only if we want to create value around human-centered organizations. In other words, don't do this as a way to cut, don't do this as a way yes. to 30% of staff. That, that, yes. That's not the right strategy. No. Yeah. Okay. No. But Josh, I, I, I would love to put this point in connect to what you always say. The telemarket place is becoming a big thing, right? Yeah. You cannot do this transformation on org design without thinking about the employee experience. So the telemarket place provides the platform for the employee to start understanding the skills required for them to create a career that will develop into a valuable role next uh, for their career. But I think uh, it's really important for us to think that um, this idea of managers is really important. If we don't bring them along, you lose everything. Yeah. So what Cathy said is exactly what we are trying to do. Product owners and initiative owners and work stream leaders, they're taking care of the work. They're managing work. What we need to distinguish is what is the value of the manager of the future in agile organizations is the career coaching, is really caring for the employee's ability to perform at their highest level, considering culture, considering employee uh, flexibility and personal issues that impact the employee. People are talking on the, on the line here about mental health. That's how you create a system of caring for the employee, the business, and the customer. And I don't want to miss that point because the managing work is not the manager's job anymore. Every team is in cross-functional teams. My team, I don't manage any of the work of my team because they're in cross-functional teams. Mm -hmm. But I care about them and I guide them. And that's the new role of the manager, I think. Let me, we, I think we could go for two hours. By the way, if you guys want to hear more about this, come to our conference in the middle of May. We're going to really get into this topic because you guys are going to join, at least Wagner, you're going to be there. Jorgen, Jorgen, are you coming? I forget. I don't, I don't remember if you're coming, but no, no. Kathy will be Next there time. and other people. Kathy, let me go back to you for a second. So, you know, HR people are probably not clear on this topic. We did find out that when we talked to a lot of very senior HR people that they they didn't really have a process. They didn't they didn't have someone like Wagner there to help them. What do you what have you learned about HR and what HR should do to facilitate this whole topic and really create capabilities here? Yeah, I think I think the the points we talked about were around understanding the employees, involving the employees, understanding the business problems, understanding your customers. I think that's really where HR can add most value because we found out it's not so much about what methodology you use for org design, right? It's more about who your business is, what your customers need, and how what your employees need to, to in order to be most productive and most successful. So I think understanding the business and understanding and so, employees so, so is that's really an important. interesting point. So let me just kind of key on that because we're running out of time. Is yeah. that this isn't something that HR does in a vacuum and comes back exactly. out of voila, here it is. This exactly. It's really an employee manager centric project. It's exactly. Facilitated and supported by HR. Is that, is that exactly? Correct? That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah, you can't do. You can't understand the work of employees without involving the, the employees themselves, right? Like, 
I have, I'm not a nurse. I don't know what the nurse job is. If I was in a healthcare organization, I still wouldn't know exactly what the nurse job is, right? Because the nurses do this job all the time. I don't do it, right? So exactly, like involving employees directly, involving managers directly, involving leaders directly, and facilitating this process, not doing the process to them, but doing it with them. Okay, let me, let me, we got four more minutes. I got one more question for you guys, and we'll go, we'll go quick here, and then we'll finish up. Um, if you look back over the last two or three years in both your situations um, uh, of going through the org design you've been through, what is one thing that has been, you know, success, highly successful, and what, if anything, do you think really didn't work that you learned from this? And I know it might take you a second to think of this, but um, you give, a, give, give these people a little bit of, you know, summary. <laughs> I think um, if, if I can start, I think the co-creation part is, I think, the biggest chance of, of creating something really where the organization is engaged okay. uh, because uh, it's it's really hard to force change on people. But if they think they are part of the solution and they create their own baby, then you have uh, the mature, not the mature, not everybody is always behind, right? But you have a big chunk of people behind. And looking back, um, I think I not I, but we underestimated that um, the processes in the organization, in the huge organization, need to be adapted to this new organizational setup. Um, and this work is tedious, but important. So what is written is, all, uh, make it leaner, make it understandable, but what is written needs to be changed as well, unless... The, the, so there's the, a lot the, of business the, process stuff that's yes. gets sort of left in the dust. Yes, <laughs> yeah. yes, yes. Okay. Wagner, what is very... For me, it's very easy. The talent catalyst, creating a fungible talent pool that can be deployed according to the needs of the business was genius, was great. I think that worked really well. It's working really well. What I would do differently is trying to convince leaders that they need to focus in org design, in work design, when they're not ready to do so. So the key idea here is start where your client is, no further. <laughs> right. Okay. <clears throat> all right. We're out of time. And I really want to thank all three of you for, for helping with this. Kathy, it's a spectacular research effort you've been doing. And we are not, oh, this is not over. Uh, we are continuing to study this. We're going to be publishing research by industry and the GWI work we're doing. Um, we're, there's a whole track on this topic at our conference in May, the Irresistible Conference. We encourage you to come. And watch out for the super class coming um, earlier this summer. Uh, and, and all of you, please reach out to us if you have questions. Uh, this is not a black or white domain. We will always be working on it. And thank you, LRP and Tim, for putting together the whole program. Thank you so much. Tim, I think we're done. Back thank you. Webinar attendees, this concludes today's event. And we do thank you for attending.